You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Great War Premium episode number 38. Before we dive into the primary topic of this episode, which is Ireland and conscription, I just wanted to touch on two topics. The first is how the early 20th century ideas about womanhood interacted with the push to introduce conscription in Western democracies, and the second being the interactions between Native Americans and the American government during the war, especially around conscription and volunteerism during the conflict. These are just two topics that I ended up running into while researching conscription, which I found interesting, so I'm going to throw them here at the beginning of the episode, even though they don't tie in really at all with Ireland. The main course of this episode will be around the British efforts to introduce conscription in Ireland late in the war. This was a controversial topic in the British government and was certainly not looked on favorably by Irish nationalists. When it was approved by Parliament in London, it would have important ramifications that would play an important role in increasing the tensions within Ireland in the run-up to the post-war Irish Civil War. Of all the villains portrayed by the conscriptionist movements, the white middle-aged mother was not one that I expected to find playing such an important role during the war. There was particular concern among American conscriptionists, which in America was called uh, selective service, that the pre-war peace movement, which was led mostly by white feminists, would play a subversive role against the implementation of conscription. The conscriptionists would implement a different strategy when attacking these groups when compared to males. When attacking male anti-conscriptionists or pacifists, the obvious attack vector was in attacking their bravery and patriotism, calling them cowards and comparing them to women. Of course, when attacking women, they could not compare them to women, and so they called out their excessive attachment to their sons and dismissed their feelings as sentimental nonsense. In 1915, a top 10 song in the United States was I Didn't Raise My Boy to Be a Soldier, and this became both an anthem for anti-war mothers and also the centerpiece for criticism from conscriptionists. For Americans, the war would be over before this conflict of viewpoints would fully resolve itself, but it would return during World War II. Another group that had more complex interactions with conscription than was normal was Native Americans. While American conscription efforts were resisted by white peace activists, it would also be resisted by Native Americans. When America entered the war, many Native Americans would volunteer for the military, and then when conscription was introduced, many would accept it. But much like any other group of Americans, there would also be those who would resist its implementation. Many groups would see conscription as yet another example of the government weakening the autonomy of Native American groups that had been guaranteed in previous agreements between the federal government and the tribes to have this kind of autonomy. In some instances, this resistance was through official channels, like that of the Iroquois Council, but in others it would, be the re- it would result in violent confrontations between Native Americans and the authorities. This would hinder relations between Native American groups and the federal government during the war, and would again be a disagreement that would not be fully resolved during the conflict. We now shift our focus over to Ireland. During the 19th century, Ireland had been a very important recruiting ground for the British Army. This influence slowly declined in the last few decades of the century due to demographic changes, especially around the rural depopulation of Ireland. But in the early decades of the 19th century, almost half of all the NCOs in the British Army came from Ireland. One of the interesting little conflicts within the army in the late 19th century was actually concerns about the declining percentage of Scottish volunteers that were placed in Scottish units, with this decline being partially compensated for by bringing in Irish volunteers into those Scottish units. This trend caused concern among Irish regiments that they were losing their Scottish identity. This little anecdote doesn't really play into our story today, I just thought it was interesting. (laughs) 
Anyway, the role of military volunteerism in Irish society would be in conflict with the growing Irish nationalism in the decades before the war. It would then play an important role in the home rule debate that would dominate Irish politics in the years immediately before 1914. When the war started, the Irish party leader in the British Parliament, Redmond, would pledge Irish support for the war. This was generally well received by all but the most ardent na Irish nationalists, and in the early months of the war there would be a huge response to British calls for volunteers. Throughout August and September, thousands of Irishmen would volunteer for service, with both Northern and Southern, and therefore Unionists and Nationalists, being well represented. In Glasgow newspapers, on the heels of the Home Rule Bill, which would have created a level of Irish autonomy, it would publish glowing calls for Irish volunteers, saying that men should come to the colors to, quote, defend the empire to which for the first time Ireland has been admitted on terms of dignity, equality, and mutual consent. The Irish nation, having at length secured the national liberty for which it has struggled for so long, enters simultaneously on a partnership in the empire with the sister kingdoms and other dominions of the realm overseas. Ireland no longer needs to look at the Union Jack as the ensign of the country's enslaver. Ireland stands side by side with her sister countries as enemies of the German despot. The real line of defense for Irish freedom is the line of allied armies holding back the Germans from Belgium and France. The rush of volunteers would continue, much like in other areas of Britain, but by mid-1915, with the war looking to continue far into the future, volunteer numbers dropped drastically. In Ireland, this realization of a long war was particularly important because the agreement had been that Home Rule would not be enacted until the war was over, which in August 1914 had not seemed so bad, but now it became clear that the end of the war may be far in the future, and therefore Home Rule was as well. At the same time that Irish support for the war was in question, discussions began happening in London on the topic of conscription. These discussions began with the idea that conscription could, should be extended to all British territories, including Ireland. However, Ireland would eventually be removed from what would become the first military service bill, but it was clear even at this early stage that Irish conscription was a divisive issue among both the Irish and British politicians. Among British conservatives, led by Boner Law, and among British newspapers that favored conscription, there were accusations that excluding Ireland from conscription amounted to punishing the rest of the country. It was a form of favoritism when the country needed to be united in its sacrifice. On the other side of the argument, there were concerns about the amount of resistance that would be encountered when trying to extend conscription into Ireland. Lord Wimborne, the leader of the government in Ireland, would write to Lloyd George in October 1916 on this topic, saying that, the fact is that it does not appear to be feasible to demand national service from any community without a general measure of consent, and of such general consent there is at present no evidence. As with everything in Ireland at this point in history, there were huge divisions within the Irish society between those in the north around Ulster and those in the south. Generally, there was huge support for conscription among northern unionists. In this, they were led by their leader, Carson, and they were convinced that conscription needed to be introduced in all of Ireland. They would use the argument that as part of the United Kingdom, the government actually had no right to exclude a particular area of the country from obligation of conscription. This extreme support for conscription would drastically change in 1916, when discussions began in London about tying the Home Rule Bill to conscription. Now, the Home Rule Bill had only been passed when the war began, but its implementation had been delayed until the war was over. With the possibility that it would be implemented sooner, the Northern Unionists quickly soured on the entire idea. They had only went along with the Home Rule Bill in the first place because of its delayed implementation and the hope that they would be able to alter it before it was put in place. With it being used as a way of gaining support for conscription among Irish nationalists, the Northern Unionists quickly began to resist conscription. The idea of tying Home Rule to conscription would begin in December 1916, when Lloyd George became Prime Minister. Lloyd George was a conscriptionist, and the push for more conscripts would continue for the rest of the war, a push that we discussed last week. With Ireland being seen as an untapped resource, it was always a topic of discussion any time conscription was expanded by Parliament. Lord Milliner would do a good job of describing the pro-Irish conscription viewpoint, 
quote, the generals needed conscripts to maintain the strength of the divisions in France. These men could be found in Ireland. There would be bloodshed in taking them, but the firmness by the British government would have the moral effect there. Ireland would be better for the improvement of the men drilled. While some in the British government believed that conscription would actually help the Irish, from a political perspective, the chances of getting Irish conscription implemented were quite slim, as the Labour representative on the War Cabinet would explain. Conscription for Ireland is, I think, impossible, unless you get the assent of the Irish party, which is not likely. If those oppose, they are sure to carry Labour with them. It is estimated that there were about 161,000 Irishmen who would be eligible for conscription that were not part of war production or agriculture. This number was important because it was quite large. It was important for the government to have a real solid number because it was accepted right from the beginning that Irish conscription would almost certainly require some number of troops as security forces to be sent to Ireland to actually implement it. The question was whether it would require more security forces than conscripts that conscription would produce. Throughout 1917, the debate on conscription would mostly just simmer, but it would not come to a boil. But with the German spring offensives in 1918 and the British Army's need for men, Ireland would once again find itself in the crosshairs. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Lloyd George was something of a realist when it came to what Irish conscription would mean, and he knew it might result in bloodshed. But he was also being asked in early 1918 by the other ministers to expand conscription, and so he asked them how they could possibly extend conscription to all other citizens from 18 to 45, married and unmarried, and how the government could pull more men from essential war industries while Irishmen of all ages were still totally exempt. There were serious concerns among the British leaders that another expansion of conscription, which still excluded Ireland, might cause public opinion to firmly set itself against the government. This would be the point that home rule would begin to be tied to the conscription expansion. It basically was added as bait, or I guess as a reward, for the Irish support for conscription in the hope that it would placate the Irish political leaders. On April 9th, Irish conscription would be part of the new military service bill. It contained a clause that the government could extend conscription to Ireland by an order of council. However, due to political reasons... Home Rule's uh, implementation was not included in this bill. 
Over in Ireland, Lord Wimburn, who would soon be relieved of his post as the top British leader in Ireland, would say that, quote, I have repeatedly warned you and your colleagues of the political, food supply, and economic consequences attendant upon an, an attempt to enforce conscription in Ireland. Other British leaders agreed with him. Even many who had supported Irish conscription in 1916 when the first military service bill was introduced now changed their mind. Their primary concern was that after the Easter Rising, the support for Sinn Féin, uh, who strongly opposed any British influence in Ireland, had massively increased. They brought with them not only an anti-British mindset, but also an acceptance that resistance to that British influence might mean violence, and they were totally okay with that. Some Irish leaders believed that if the British tried to implement conscription, that it, would, that it would be violently resisted in almost every single town and village. With the shaky status of home rule, the nationalist Irish party was totally against Irish conscription. But against their very vocal opposition, the new military service bill was put to a vote in Parliament without home rule attached. When it was accepted with a vote to 301 to, 300, to 103, the Irish party walked out. This was a watershed moment in Irish politics. For decades, the Irish party had worked with the British government in London to try and keep Irish leaders in a working relationship with the British. At the same time, Sinn Féin had pursued a policy of not working with the British at all. With the conscription vote, the British pushed the Irish party, along the moderates, into the hands of Sinn Féin, the avowed extremists. This was in many ways the beginning of the end of the once dominant Irish party, which was soon replaced by the far less moderate Sinn Féin. With the Irish party walkout, it would jointly pledge with Sinn Féin that they were, quote, denying the right of the British government to enforce compulsory service in this country, being Ireland. We pledge ourselves sol solemnly to one another to resist conscription by the most effective means at our disposal. The Catholic Church, more than any other official group within Ireland, was responsible for uniting Irish opinion against conscription. In an official statement from the Catholic bishops in Ireland, they would so state, quote, To enforce conscription here without the consent of the people would be perfectly unwarrantable, and would soon and inevitably end in defeating its own purposes. It would be a fatal mistake, surpassing the worst blunders of the past four years. At the same time, the nationalist newspapers would also trumpet a very anti-conscription message, with one stating that to try to enforce conscription would be an act of insanity, that it would kill every chance of a political settlement, and that it would create a new war front in Ireland. One of the reasons that the reaction to the introduction of conscription was so severe was that up until early 1918, there was a widely held opinion that the British would never try to implement conscription in Ireland. Most of this belief was due to the fact that it would be unwise to even attempt it, since it was against the wishes of the Irish party and would so clearly move Irish opinion further from that of the British, yet it had been done, and indeed Irish opinion moved closer to Sinn Féin and away from the British. With conscription in Ireland in place, opposition began. Initially, it was quite disorganized. It did not take long for this to change, though. Some people were would attend public meetings, and while they were not at this point organized by a central authority, they began to coalesce around some local organizations. In newspapers all over the country, ads began to appear that promoted local meetings. These ads used inflammatory language, like one titled Declaration of War. They generally announced a central place of protest, generally at the local center of government, and that same ad, titled Declaration of War, would describe the planned protest as, quote, a protest against the compulsory conscription of Ireland's manhood by an alien government, and to pledge ourselves to resist it by the most effective means at our disposal. As the protest grew in size, the government began their response. On May 16th, a large number of Sinn Féin leaders were arrested, with 73 immediately sent to England. The, fact with, the hope with this move was that Sinn Féin would lose its cohesion, with most of its leaders off in English jails, but this was not the outcome. With so much protesting happening in Ireland, back in London, the tone of discussions changed. There were no longer discussions about home rule or other ways of sweetening the deal. Instead, the topic of Irish conscription moved on to one of the authority of Parliament, 
This meant that more troops were sent to Ireland to make sure conscription was carried out. This also meant that the equation for how many troops the army expected to gain from Irish conscription versus how many it took to keep the peace drastically changed. By June, there were over 100,000 British troops in Ireland, and up to that point, there had been almost no successful conscriptions. That old 160,000 number that had been used in the push for conscription would never materialize, mostly because the Irishmen refused to even register with the government, let alone show up when conscripted. The problem with Irish conscription would never be solved during the war. Instead, the war would end, and that would remove the problem. However, the long-lasting consequences of the attempts of the British to put conscription into place would not go away. The Irish party found itself without a base of support, and with it went the most moderate voice of the Irish nationalists. Ireland was on its way to civil war. Later this year, in our mainline History of the Great War episodes, we will cover that Irish civil war in detail, and this will be sort of the start of it. <laughs> 